Hey, this is John Bollinger with Premier Guitar, and I'm with Uli John Roth, uh, shortly before his concert in Nashville, Tennessee. Uli, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for Pleasure. having me. Now, tell me about this. This is this iconic signature guitar that you've been playing for quite some time. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I've been playing Sky Guitars since um, the 80s, early 80s. And um, there were only like five originals. They were all prototypes, including the first ever seven string. And um, then I played these for many years, uh, but a lot of people actually copied them you know, without my permission, and they were usually very bad copies because all they had to go by were, were photos, and um, that is, uh, it's a very difficult guitar to build uh, for several reasons. And um, so, good friend of mine, uh, the CEO of, of Teen Guitars, Elliot Rubinson, actually persuaded me to make a signature series. And at first I was a little hes hesitant because it's, a, it's just so personal to me, but then I thought that um, the advantage would be, first of all, other people would be able, I, it would be shared with other people, but uh, we would be able to build prototypes and, and um, you know, make uh, further progress. So that's what we did. In the end, um, we had a limited edition of 50, uh, which we're just sold now. So we are going to do um, a new edition, which will be slightly different. But um, the Sky Guitar came about because um, I was traditionally a, a Strat player um, in the Scorpions and uh, I had a beautiful white Strat, which I still have, um, 1975 model. Um, but when I was playing uh, leads, um, increasingly I had the urge to play a little higher mm -hmm. than, than you could on the Strat because the Strat stops on the C sharp. Wow. <laughs> I don't even have cotton wool in my ear right now. Um, it stops on the on that note, and um, I wanted to go like like here, you know, and I couldn't. So um, the first idea I had was to extend the strat. So my guitar builder, Andy Dimitrio in Brighton at that time, um, he actually put two extra frets onto the strat. So I had two extra frets mm. and uh, then I was able to play two notes higher, which I did and, and it was great. Uh, he did a great job and then he said, look, I can build you any guitar you like. And then it clicked. Uh, that was the first moment where I actually had the idea to even think about my own guitar because before uh, that, that was inconceivable, you know. And then that set a whole thing in motion uh, because then I really thought about what I wanted. I wanted really a guitar which was had everything the Strat, Strat had, sound-wise um, and playing-wise, but more. I also wanted a little bit of a hybrid because I love the sound of the Les Paul, mm -hmm. um, which is a completely different animal to the Strat. You know, the Strat to me is always like a pencil drawing, very crystal clear, but essentially hard, whereas the Les Paul is very feminine soft and um, and creamy sounding, you know, uh, rich sounding. And I wanted both. And um, that was another thing. Anyways, uh, to get the extended uh, range, um, I had to come up with a shape that allowed that. And away went the lower cutaway. That's the first thing. But I also wanted a guitar that was visually pleasing and balanced. You know, and so this guitar is um, has its own kind of symmetry. It's not perfectly symmetrical, but it feels symmetrical, and to me that was very, very important. So I ended up with all these frets going, <coughs> going up here, and um, the first guy guitar, the frets just kept getting smaller and smaller, and there were I think 36 of them, which meant like with normal fingers it became very hard to make these notes sound right. And um, so I had the idea to have whole tone steps at the, at the top, oh. you know. <coughs> yes? Uh, and that worked great because I can get like an amazing sound. Plug your ears. Right here, right. which you would never get. Uh, if, if they were not uh, spaced like whole tone steps. The only downside is you don't have any semitones. 
you know, um, so the semitones I'm creating by crisscrossing the string. Yeah? Mm. It's a little uncomfortable, but then here in the top range, I don't play these virtuoso runs normally. It's more to really be able to go, go up into the sky and, and fly, you know? So I play, tend to play more slowly up there, except for if I play some classical pieces which are more demanding, you know, like the Vivaldi stuff. Anyway, so that's the idea. And also that's where the scalloping came from because I needed to be able to pick without hitting the, um, the fingerboard. Oh. So I thought, let's do that. I had seen Richie Blackmore do that, but, and I had never tried it, and I liked it a lot. So from then on, all my guitars became scalloped because um, to me it feels better and it sounds better even, you know. Some people might disagree, but I hear a very clear uh, difference in sound. It's just more singing um, because you're, um, I, I think there's various reasons for that. So that's that, you know, and that's why they are called sky guitar, because you can play so high. And some of them have a seven string, and this one is just a six string. Um, <coughs> then the other thing that we needed was uh, a pickup system that could, could deliver this uh, outrageous kind of um, freedom that I wanted. I wanted to be able, at the flick of a knob, to dial in a uh, superb, like Les Paul tone, or a real strat tone or something in between, you know? And with this system, I can do that. And let me explain. It was designed by my good friend um, and electronic, electronic genius, John Orham from England, who made his name mm, designing big mixing consoles, like the old Trident mixing boards, etc. And so he had, he had superb ear and, take, uh, and the right kind of knowledge about the analog electronics. You know, so this is an active system, and it is so powerful, it's easily the most powerful in the world. Um, that's why we have an 18-volt power supply. I could run it on batteries, but uh, it only lasts a few hours, and, uh, you know, uh, then to me, that's not a big deal. I have the power supply, so... So, so the power supply, so it's sending, uh, it's, it's sending phantom power through, through Yes, uh, and I have a stereo lead. So the st it comes through the stereo lead, and uh, half of that lead uh, creates the sound, and the other is just the power, oh. you know? And, um, yeah. And that allows you to have these, these active controls on Active well? controls and lights, you know, I've got lights everywhere. Oh, that's great. Uh, which is absolutely necessary, because um, I don't see a thing when I play anymore. I used to have great eyesight, but now when I look down without glasses, in the dark, you know, it's just, or even when there's like um, big stage lights, it's just a big blur. Sure. You know, so I normally, I tend to just use the force. Most <laughs> of the time I get away with it, but with these lights, it helps when you're playing something tricky. You immediately yeah. know your position, you know, and, and I love it. And I can dim them, I can dim them at the back, although I tend to have them quite strong always. I like the glare. Sure. Uh, whenever that's on, it feels like, yeah, we've got something, you know, there we're ready to to roll. Yeah. So that's the power supply and these electronics are pretty outrageous because uh, first of all when I asked John to design these pickups or that entire system which uh, we aptly called Mega Wing because initially had four coils for each pickup um, he said oh well that can't be done and he's the person who would never say that can't be done you know he said don't even go there but I kept nagging him and three days later he came up with an idea. So anyway, to get a long story short, what this guitar does, see this is a perfectly clean sound, but I've got like a huge dB uh, gain boosted. No other guitar can do that uh, because I'm playing on the clean channel on one at the moment, on a hundred watt amp. Wow! You know, yes, without so without any effects so except all that for the dirt echo. Is through generated yeah, through that the is air. this is just this, um, but that's just the beginning, because I've got three other knobs here, and each one gives me another 20 dB boost of my favorite frequency range. I've got a bass boost here, you know, um, which 
I can take out 20 dB and I can bring into it. And I'm using that a lot on stage because every stage is different. And I'm constantly re EQing the guitar uh, to the point of where it sounds perfect for me. Every day it's different, and that's why I don't have any signs. I couldn't see it anyway. I just do it by ear and feel. Um, so everything is very, um, yeah, it's almost floating on this guitar, you know? Yes, nothing is really set. Everything is like free, and you, you do it just by ear. Then I've got a very powerful mid boost, which um, pretty much is almost like a war war, war but not as brutal. Um, and it does this. Again, 20 dB. That's out. Get like a Strat sound. If you want less Paul. Or if I take it out, then you get like a telly kind of sound. If I want the Strat, I go to the single coil, um, dial in a few more things. A little bit of treble, a little bit of mid, a little bit of bass, take out, roll off some of that, and you have a beautiful... Yeah, and I can... So you can do pretty much anything. Wow. You know, um, well, it, you gets, it gets better. It gets better. <laughs> because um, we developed uh, this guitar builder, Boris Dominger. He came up with an amazing idea. So, because I said, you know, because the magnetic field of the pickups of the Strat are totally different from the mag magnetic field from the Les Paul. Um, you know, one is very crystal clear, the Strat. The Les Paul is more fuzzy, like um, a P90 or, so, or something like that. I can do both here because um, this changes the um, magnetic field. And so when I go into humbucking, it really goes into real humbucking mode and single coil is real single coil. You know? And again, this is so important for me because I'm using it all the time. And I love playing with all these colors during the gig, particularly during the improvised parts. You know, um, during a, a normal guitar lead, I wouldn't really fiddle so much, although I use the gain in order to just bring it up and down. Um, but yeah, so that's those are like the you know the most important things. And this there's actually a pickup underneath here, and that's very important to get that uh, really you know warm. get that kind of tone I wouldn't get that with the other pickups you know um, and yeah anyway so that's that's pretty much that that system um, I do use the uh, Tronicle tuning system I can't live without it uh, because I hate tuning and that thing really makes it easy for me um, on stage you know and if I want to tune up, this I'm now in E flat, if I want to tune up, it does it in a split second to E. And it has happened on stage sometimes when I jam with other people, I have to sometimes do that, you know. Or you break a string um, during, and I have floating tremolo, the guitar will be totally out of tune. This has happened to me uh, with the Smashing Pumpkins once on a TV show. This thing came off. Um, because there was a problem with, with one of the, the, the screws here, you know, mm -hmm. after many years it suddenly happened. The guitar was so out of tune, it was unbelievable, but the system brought it back into tune wow. in uh, pretty much no time at all. Yeah, I love these systems and um, they, they have a new generation coming which will be mind-blowing. Um, they're almost there. And I've been their first endorser and because the guy who built it, uh, Chris Adams, yeah. As a, as one of my best friends, and he's, uh, he's just amazing. You know, oh. I can only recommend this. Uh, it should be on every guitar.
<laughs> well, that's an incredible And it's on, on all of our, our guitars. Oh. Even my double neck uh, flamenco guitar has it. Um, yeah, and my, my guys, we have two guitar players. Um, they are both using it. Yeah. So. Does the, if you buy your signature uh, guitar at Dean, will it come with the tuner on it? Uh, the new ones will. Oh. The first series didn't because the tuners didn't exist at that time oh. uh, to that specification. Um, yeah, we absolutely. You know, I want a guitar which is like total cutting edge, but at the same time gives me like the total analog traditional feel of a real instrument. That is so important. And uh, I need both, you know. And, and this guitar uh, delivers that. Yeah, that's the most unique signature guitar I've ever seen. It's amazing. Yeah. All those. And they're all different, you know. I mean, they have different finishes, and so um, they even come with names. They all have names. This one is, is Lionheart. It's one of my favorite all rounders. On this guitar, you can do anything, it kind of plays by itself. I remember when I first got this guitar, it was. Uh, it was at the NAMM show in, I think, 2012. We had a gig in Ramona at the night or somewhere, no, whatever. Orange, whatever. Yeah. Um, the, he sent me the guitar and I took it out of the case. I walked onto the stage and we played the gig. It was that perfect. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, so they're all, yeah, they're just amazing. I, I love them. You know? Fantastic. It happened to me last uh, two weeks ago in, in Japan. I was there video editing and um, I did a video shoot for um, the, uh, the number one guitar magazine there, Young Guitar. Didn't have a Sky Guitar because I wasn't there for So they uh, asked around, one person had two and he had one of the latest ones. He gave me that guitar and I did the whole demonstration. It was perfect, you know, I was so jealous. <laughs> I want them all. <laughs> but they come with a price tag of $14,000 for the um, for the uh, seven string, and so it's not for the faint hearted. And that guy had two of them. Oh, yeah, there wow. are, you know, there <laughs> are some collectors in Japan. That most of them are in Japan. Hmm. There are quite a few in America, yeah. you know, and some people have two, wow. ordering the third one as we speak. Wow, that's great. Well, I'm just addicted to them, you know. Yeah. I, I don't want to play any other guitar live, I have no desire to do that. Right, well, yeah. You see, <laughs> you see I mean, so, so that's basically, that's my effect. Because all I'm doing is um, I'm just connected to a carbon copy um, delay. And uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, that's all. So you your know? pedal boards are, is really simple. Well, at the moment, I mean, sometimes I go a little overboard, but when we're having to fly, you know, that's, that's what we're doing, you know. So um, you have two carbon copies. I have two like. carbon, I should have three. In fact, I have a third for my um, classical um, uh, um, nylon string guitar, which I'll play tonight, um, and they're, they're set differently. The yeah. carbon copy is not necessarily the best echo around, but for stage it's perfect because mm -hmm. it tails off very nicely like an old tape echo. Uh, so that's why I use them. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the power supply here yeah. for the Sky guitar, which comes with an on-off switch. So, you know, stand oh, okay. by, stand by. Um, that's just a little chorus that uh, our guitar player gave me. Um, I, I sometimes have others. I have Black Star Chorus, which is nice. I have, I don't know, I have a whole bunch, but at the moment, I don't have it with me. This thing is a mean machine. I call it the communist because, yeah, look at the sign. It looks like straight <laughs> from Cuba. Um, a guy in Greece, in some little, town in the middle of nowhere built it and he came and he said try this and now um, I only ever use it once during the show because it's basically I identical to an old fuzz face um, you know the Dallas Arbiter so I'm always using it to really simulate the ultimate destruction <laughs> and all the new ones they're building none comes close to the old one because I'm playing uh, these um, amps these 100 watt amps on the clean channel. In fact, I, I don't have overdrive. And these are based very much on my favorites, um, uh, Plexi Super Lead, 100 watt, um, except they're, they're a lot more robust. They mm -hmm. don't break. The, the Plexis were mm -hmm. always like goners when I played 
You so know, those would be Blackstar Artisan Black 100? Artisan, yeah. It's, to me, that's the best amp they have. But um, it, it's not a metal amp because it doesn't come with a preamp. And you really have to know what you're doing with this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a um, little unforgiving because, yeah, like, like these amps are. Once you know what, what you're doing, they're great. But um, yeah, it's quite an, an animal. Um, so <coughs> this thing, this communist thing, it's, sorry, I don't know what it's called, um, is like really brutal. And what it does, what it does is this. <laughs> It's like the world is ending. Exactly. <laughs> so it's cataclysmic <laughs> times 10. And we have this song called Fly to Rainbow where even in the Scorpions, when we used to play it, um, lots of uh, speaker PA systems blew up because the guy, our guy, got so carried away in the middle, he used to rotate it. And the Scorpions used to carry their own speakers. Some of them were hand-built by Francis Buchholz. He put them together because he was like an engineer kind. And so often this happened, <laughs> another tweeter blown thanks to this. And it was pretty identical in terms of sheer destructive power. <laughs> and you can't get anything on the market, at least not. People give me gadgets all the time. And some of them, they look great, but none does this. You know, so I'm only using it once during a show, but it's enough. I yeah. can't. I can't use it for music. Yeah, the building it's would just, fall down. Yes. If you used it well, you, I told you to plug your ears. <laughs> oh, I did. Yeah. Okay. No, no, I did. So this baby here is just a normal um, tube screamer, which uh, I don't use a lot. But sometimes I can get everything really from the guitar. But sometimes I want to go from A to B very quickly, and sure. that has a slightly different tone. So sometimes I'm using that. Um, my whammy has. Uh, I have lots of whammy pedals and I love them to me. It's like the most interesting effect. It's only recently that I really dialed in and found an interesting way to do something with, with these uh, things. Um, I'm always using it more like an octave kind of thing. And uh, when I use it, because it makes the sound a little brighter, uh, digital, I'm always putting in lots of bass end, lots of mid, I roll off the top end and I go into humbucking mode. And then I play very quietly. But I also use it like, uh, yeah, sometimes for, uh, for overkill. I might do this as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting device. And um, I use it maybe two or three times during the gig. Yeah. And that's it. That's pretty much the effect I'm using. At you see, I forgot to bring a, a war war. So we're doing all along the watchtower. And I, I don't have a war war, and it sucks. Um, <laughs> we, yeah. And yeah, so um, yeah, that's basically this. You know, um, this amp, I'm setting it uh, so not too extreme. You know, my, sure. most of the controls are like, like uh, just half. And here, as you've seen, this I was on one, literally. Um, if I crank it more, it doesn't get that much louder because the guitar is feeding it sure. to the point of no return. In fact, then probably it'll, the sound will deteriorate at some point. You know, mic-wise, these mics I don't like, and my writer normally always says SM58 because the SM58 for me, oh, she's got one in there. No, that's not yours. 
that's uh, that's Andy's. The SM58 mm -hmm. is a more rounder sound. This, this to me sounds too nasal, and everybody's using it. They, they always sound the same. I don't like that, you know. Um, these are normal 4x12s, 300 watt each. Um, and you're running both of those? No. Um, in a small club, well, this isn't even small, but, you know, I, I try to be a little lenient sure. because the people in the first row, they're like, these things are so directional. Yeah. There you won't be able to hear it with the band, but here it's a lethal death ray. And, uh, I mean, um, I'm entertaining the idea about putting plexi, but then it, then it might really take away some of the sound on stage. I like the way it feels on stage. On the bigger stages, if you play Sun Plaza Hall in Japan or something like that, or a festival, most of the time I'll have two connected, or I will very often play two amps um, with a splitter. I have Lele splitters, mm. active and passive ones. Um, also, I'm using this amp. It's a very interesting little amp a friend of mine made. It's called Blue Guitar. Thomas Blug is, a, is a, an excellent German guitar player, and he built this amp, which is a 100 watt amp. It only weighs 1.2 kilos. It's, um, it's very smooth, and I'm using it on stage because it gives me a completely different tone. It balances this one. Um, it's much more gentle, and you can play it at the lowest volume. You know, so if I have like an orchestra gig, this is the amp. Uh, I'd be using. And also when I play my seven string acoustic nylon, um, I'm going through this amp mm. and I'm going through one of these cabs, you know, plus a DI. Yeah. So that's pretty much my setup, you know, um, and it, it changes, but uh, those are the most important things, you know. Any, any questions? No, but it's an honor meeting you, man. I mean, you really are the guy that just invented the whole neoclassical <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, but <laughs> you, you know, all I did really was, there were great players around then, um, but I was so into classical music and I didn't hear any of the other guys doing that. You know, they were all either pentatonic or semi-pentatonic, shall we say. Mm -hmm. and. I couldn't understand, why is nobody doing that? It was so obvious. But um, I heard these arpeggios in my mind, you know. But I didn't know how to do them. I needed to find a fingering that allows that. Because, um, yeah, I, uh, you know, it didn't exist at that time. So I found various ways to do that and do it smoothly and, and incorporated it uh, on, in the early uh, Scorpions albums. And then uh, later on with Electric Sun, I took it a whole notch further uh, with melodic arpeggios, you know, and that was all. It, it came from the classical. Um, in classical music, these kind of things have been around for hundreds of years, but the guitar is still in its infancy. The electric guitar is maybe 50, 60 years old, you know, starting with uh, one of the greatest Django Reinhardt. I did listen to Django, you know, and he was like perfect with uh, his kind of stuff. And he, um, he did a lot of single... Uh, always just with two fingers, you know. And I learned a lot uh, listening to Django. And again, other players didn't really do that in that field. So I think that's what gave me the edge. And I also have a, a real love for flamen flamenco playing. So I listened to the flamenco players and I studied the classical guitar when I was a kid. More so than this even. So it was and the violin and, and the piano. So it was a foregone conclusion that I wanted to hear that on the electric guitar. And somehow I found a way to bring this into a hard rock band, the Scorpions, because we, suddenly we started playing diminished chords, which are a no-no. You know, the Beatles did that kind of stuff, you know, but in, in rock, not many people did, you know, and all I did was play over it, you know, yeah. so <laughs> melodically. The right. key was that, you know, Arpeggios shouldn't be mindless up and down noodlings. They, to me, that there needs to be a point. It needs to have a, a logic, and um, the, that logic to me is uh, is in the melody. So I will do a, an arpeggio, but it leads to another something. It ends on a note, and that note is part of the overall melodic structure. You know, that's that's very very important. You know. Like, <laughs> Thank you.
you know? So, um, and then you, you just speed it up here. It's also important to play it very cleanly. You know, when I'm at home, when I pick up a guitar, I, I'm never through an amp. It's always just like that. And that to me is uh, the most important thing. You need to be able to make the guitar sound great, dry, without anything. Because the sound is in the fingers and in your mind. You know, you need to develop a vision of the tone that you want to hear and then you go for that. And your fingers will follow if you do the right kind of things, you know. Uh, unfortunately, in nowadays, a lot of players are not tone conscious anymore. Um, I remember in the 60s, you could walk into some kind of club. There was a guy who could barely play, but had like a good guitar and an AC30 sounding good. I remember that so clearly. You know, nowadays there are a lot of people who can, you know, shred like, uh, like hell, but sometimes they sound so awful and they don't even notice it. You know, to me that's not music. You know, so um, that's why I'm always beware of overdrive pedals. You know, um, it's like a pact with the devil. I don't like it. You know, I'll use it for entertainment purposes, but never to do serious music with it. You know, because I'm, again, coming from the classical world, my mind is geared towards tone production. And it needs to be either beautiful or magical or whatever. Never ugly. And um, in classical music, you have to blend with the, with the violin because they they do everything naturally, mm -hmm. and you know we are connected through through uh, with gadgets. We go through speakers. Everything is much further away. It's not so direct. That's why for me it's important to be able to just make that guitar sound good. You know, um, without anything clean. So this is just basically clean, you know, and, and that's how I play. You know, it's, uh, it's actually quite simple. Yeah, it's, it really, it's in your hands. I mean, that really is what it comes down to. But really, what a pleasure, man. Just mm -hmm. thanks for joining. Thanks for sharing that with, uh, with PG. And uh, enjoy the tour, PG. man. PG. PG, that's Premier Guitar. Yes. Well, in <laughs> England, it would be PG Tips, which is one of their most famous brand of tea. Oh, really? Everybody <laughs> drinks PG Tips. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> there you have it. We have it. Well, cheers till next time. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Don't forget to sign up for PG Perks, your all-access pass to exclusive gear giveaways and discounts on PremierGuitar.com.